And to launch us into vigorous conversation this morning, we welcome Max King back to moderate our first panel, an editor's discussion about the importance of a free press. Mr. King is president and chief executive officer of the Pittsburgh Foundation and former editor of the Philadelphia Inquirer. He has previously served as president of the Pittsburgh-based Heinz Endowments and as founding director of the Fred Rogers Center for Early Learning and Children's Media at St. Vincent College in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. His recently published book, The Good Neighbor, is the first full biography of children's educational television pioneer, Fred Rogers. Our distinguished panelists for this segment include Dean P. Baquet, Martin Barron, and David Schribman. And gentlemen, would you please join me on stage? <laughs> Dean Baquet is executive editor of the New York Times, where he previously served as managing editor and Washington Bureau Chief, and earlier in his career, served as National Editor and Deputy Metro Chief. Mr. Baquet has also served as Editor of the Los Angeles Times and as a reporter for the Chicago Tribune, where he won a Pulitzer Prize for investigative reporting on corruption in the Chicago City Council. He is the recipient of numerous awards including, most recently, the prestigious Freedom of the Press Award. Martin, Marty Barron, is executive editor of the Washington Post. Throughout his career, newsrooms under his leadership have won 14 Pulitzer Prizes, seven of them at the Post. He served for 11 and a half years as editor of the Boston Globe, which received six Pulitzer Prizes, for investigative reporting during his tenure. <clears throat> Mr. Barron has been inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and received the Al Newharth Award for Excellence in Media. David Tridman is executive editor of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette and a nationally syndicated columnist. He previously served as assisting manager editor, columnist, and Washington bureau chief at the Boston Globe as national political correspondent for the Wall Street Journal, covered Congress and national politics for the New York Times, and was a member of the national staff of the Washington Star. Mr. Shridman received the Pulitzer Prize in 1995 for his coverage of Washington and the American political scene. Well, thank you guys all for being with us today. Sure. This is clearly an extraordinary time to be the editor of a newspaper, uh, a time when uh, these three guys have got an, an, a powerfully important job to do every day in literally battlefield circumstances. I can't think of a time since the 60s and early 70s that has been so intense uh, for newspaper editors, and we're, um, so fortunate to have three of the most influential editors in the country here to talk with us uh, today. Now, I know that one of the ethics for editors of newspapers is that you are to be dispassionate, you're, you're to, be, you're to uh, be a step back. Uh, some people use the word objective. I want to flip that for my first question <laughs> and make it subjective. I want to know what it feels like at a time like this to be, to be doing such a critically important job for the country and to be attacked constantly for doing it. It must feel astounding. Uh, Marty, let's start with you. Oh, I thought you were going to say you wanted us to act up or something like that <laughs> here. So, I do. <laughs> uh, liven things up that way. So, uh, you know, I mean, it has its... Uh, uh, first of all, it, a lot of it is incredibly gratifying. So uh, we get a lot of uh, notes of support. Uh, from people thanking us for the role that we're playing. Uh, they, uh, I think a lot of people in the past had taken for granted the role of news organizations like uh, ours, uh, and uh, now they don't take us for granted anymore. 
and uh, they, they support us, they're subscribing to us in record numbers, that's hugely gratifying as well, um, to have that, kind of, have that kind of support. At the same time, of course, there's criticism from all ends, and it's not just from the right, it's from the left as well. Uh, there's a lot of incoming, and then we also, you also feel like you're walking, there's incoming and then you're walking through a minefield all at the same, all at the same time. Uh, because uh, any mistake or mm -hmm. honest mistake, people will make a huge issue out of that sort of thing. So um, it's, it's intense, it's uh, all the time. There's no, no rest, particularly during this administration because Lord knows there can be a tweet at five o'clock in the morning or uh, one o'clock in the morning uh, and it might be something quite consequential. Uh, so it's exhausting in that way. But as I said, it's, on the whole, it's, it's pretty gratifying. Dean, tackle the same question, if you would. Um, I agree with him. It's, I, I, I would even venture to say um, it's more gratifying than, than anything else. I mean, newspapers, all, all newspapers were sort of um, had their backs against the wall because of the shift in our economic model. And I think we had lost a little bit of confidence in ourselves. And I think that, that, that we're in the middle of one of the great stories of a generation. All of our audiences are growing. Um, and I think that people see us as vital and important to the democracy more, more clearly than ever before. On the other hand, Marty's right. It's, um, I mean, the criticism is relentless. The praise, nicely, is more, but the criticism is also relentless. And I, and I think that um, probably the hardest thing is sort of is, is working very hard to be tough-minded but also independent um, because sometimes our readers want us to, to do things that I think none of us are quite comfortable doing. I mean, one of our, our role is to be relentlessly independent and to aggressively investigate this government and the dramatic shifts that are, that are going on in American life. And sometimes that makes our readers unhappy. And, and we're one of the few businesses that, that sometimes makes their readers unhappy, makes their audience unhappy. David, uh, because you write a column as well as edit the paper, unlike these guys, you're traveling all around the country all the time. What sort of a perspective do you get on the antipathy to the press? Well, I always say in my own office that when the uh, phone rings, it's not somebody calling to say, I love you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, but I think That's why I, I don't answer the phone. Yeah, right. <coughs> we have your private number. But the... Um, but the, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to be an editor at a different period. You wouldn't want to bat against the 2006 Pirates. You want to bat against the 1963 Dodgers with Colfax and Drysdale. You, you didn't want to be an editor at a time when it's quiet and, uh, and passive and placid. This is the best time to be an editor and in some ways the worst. We were talking at breakfast that um, you know, we, all, we get a lot of complaints. A lot of people tell us how much they hate us. Um, <laughs> You know, we kind of thrive on that, the three of us. We, we, we enjoy being hated. Uh, and we're, and we're, we're actually very, very good at it. Uh, but, you know, um, there's a great line I use about this. Ken, you might use it as a university president. Friends come and go, but enemies accumulate. <laughs> uh, I think we all are suspicious of polls. Nonetheless, the recent polls, I think the, uh, the Knight Foundation and <clears throat> did one recently, Pew did one recently, that show that uh, almost at, at record low levels, the public doesn't trust the media and doesn't trust newspapers. And I know that, that for each of you, one of the important answers to that is to just do more strong, good, honest journalism. But is there another answer? Is there uh, something uh, else that you uh, should uh, be hang doing? Hang on, Max. Yeah. Those were the same polls that said that Hillary Rodham Clinton was going to win 42 states. Exactly. Right? So um, I like to, to quote Marty on this. Uh, hmm. what, what we're doing is we're doing our work. That's what we're doing here. And it's nothing, nothing more complicated or nothing simpler than that. We're just doing our work. <laughs> But does I mean, the work speak for itself, or do you need no, to do something it, else? It doesn't entirely. I mean, I think you have to take, the, you have to, first of all, you have to put those polls in context. Uh, confidence in pretty much all major institutions in this country have seen a dramatic decline. Uh, I like to say, hey, we're better than Congress. Uh, it doesn't say very much, uh, <coughs> but, uh, but you, if you look at confidence in, in, in big business, that's declined. Confidence in religious institutions has declined. Confidence in, uh, in pretty much every institution except for the, except for the military has declined. Uh, and so it's within that context, and we see a decline in, 
and pretty much all, all major institutions in this, in this democracy. Uh, we've actually seen an actual somewhat uptick of, over the last couple of years. It's nothing really dramatic. And what you see is a high degree of polarization. Uh, so people who have, people who are on the right, they have a huge amount of confidence, let's say in Fox News, and very little confidence in a lot of other media institutions. And people who lean further to the left, they have a lot of confidence in some of those other institutions and zero confidence in, in Fox News. So uh, it's, a highly polar, it's just a highly polarized environment. And I think you know, we make a mistake when we aggregate it. What can we do? I think what we try to do and what we are, are all trying to do is try to be more uh, transparent, uh, to talk more about the kind of work we do, how we go about that work, who we are. Look, on our site, we, you can you have my phone number, you've got my, uh, although I don't answer at the phone, but, uh, <laughs> but I will get your message. Uh, and I have my email. Uh, you have our, all the backgrounds of everybody who writes for our organization, their, their professional background, their educational background, everything about them. You have our ethics code, you have our ownership structure, you have, oh, we are as transparent as we possibly can be. My phone number is in the Pittsburgh book. One of the things I would, I would add about transparency, when, when, I, when, I was a, when I was the editor of the Los Angeles Times, we did a, a readership survey, and one of the great shocks to me was that people saw the date line on a story and, didn't, and, and many of our readers didn't know that the person, that meant the writer was there. And it broke my heart because one of the date lines we showed was a reporter who, was in, who had been in Kabul for a long time. So, of course, some people think that we're not that were not credible because they don't know that that reporter lives there and spends all the time there. So, you know, I think we need to be more transparent. We, we did not grow, I didn't grow up in an industry that was transparent. I grew up in an industry that was so heavily dependent on advertising that we didn't engage with readers enough. We didn't tell them what we did. We didn't own up to our mistakes. We didn't tell them how the sausage gets made. We didn't tell them how, despite the fact that we, we are, of course, are imperfect, I, I mean, it's remarkable how much news organizations get it right. And I think we should just be more open, the way, the way Marty said, I agree. We should be more open, honest with people, tell them who we are, let them have a look. We have enough protections from the government that one of our obligations should be to be pretty open about how we operate. Are, are there things that the companies that you work for, the business side, should be doing more aggressively to explain journalism, to help people understand the critical role that journalism plays. I mean, I've always thought that, that even today, newspapers sort of let their openness and, and the quality of their work just speak for itself. But are there marketing things that papers ought to do to explain? I don't know, I mean, I, I, I think it's mostly our job, as the journalists in the organization, to do the explaining. Uh, I, I do wish that, um, you know, we talked more about how we help ordinary people. Uh, you know, long before uh, Donald Trump ran for president and talked about the forgotten men and women of America, journalistic organizations were going out and writing about the, the so-called forgotten women, men and women of America. And there are numerous cases of insta instances where, uh, you know, the reporting that we've done has brought attention to people who were being abused by powerful interests, uh, who, who, who suffered from health and safety conditions that put their their lives and their health in danger, you name it, all across the board. And we do nothing to sort of publicize that. And I wish we did that uh, because uh, I don't think that people really recognize that. You know, yes, there are the Pulitzer Prizes, the recognition, but that's all within our, within our, within our profession. Uh, but, you know, if you go back and you look at sort of public service Pulitzer Prizes, those are really, uh, it's, it's pretty extraordinary, the kinds of things that people have, have won for. And we do nothing to publicize that kind of work. Uh, I, I certainly agree with you, David, that, that polls are suspect. But I want to cite one thing that struck me because I think it tells us something about where this antipathy comes from. Uh, in one of the polls, 45% of the people uh, who are saying they don't trust, uh, particularly newspapers, referred to, to fake news and alternative facts in a way that suggests to me that to some extent, there's been a successful campaign by this administration <clears throat> yeah. to discredit you. And, and how much of that uh, is a factor and uh, worries you and is important to address? David, well, you wanna... It worries me deeply because you know, I sometimes say that in the 16 years I've been editor here, we have not knowingly published one paragraph 
one sentence, one word, or one syllable that we knew was false. And as for alternative facts, there's no alternative fact to the fact that the sun is 93 million miles from the Earth, or that two and two is four, or even the, or the quadratic equation, whatever that is, I've forgotten it. Uh, but I mean, there are no alternative facts to that, and I, I'm impatient with that, uh, with that notion, and very concerned that the administration and others have sowed that in the American mind. And I think it's, um, it's, it's a real problem for all of us. The, I, there's no question that the, that the president in particular has tried to undermine the press um, and that it's harmful. He's tried to undermine all independent institutions to a certain degree, whether it's the judiciary or the press. And I think it's tremendously harmful. I mean, it's, tr it's harmful to be, to be, for people to be told repeatedly that we make stuff up, which we don't. Um, it's harmful to be told, it's, it's remarkable for an American president to say, don't believe what you read in the press, believe what I say. Of course that's gotta have a harmful impact. I, st I still believe in the end that we're around longer than presidents <clears throat> and that our job is to stick to our guns, be transparent, truthful, and, and independent. But of course that's harmful. You know, uh, I actually brought along a quote because I knew this would come up. But, you know, um, right after uh, Tr uh, Donald Trump won the GOP nomination, he was giving an interview to Leslie Stahl, and after the interview was over, uh, she asked him, why do you keep uh, demeaning the press? Why do you keep using this fake news uh, term and that sort of thing? And you know what he said? He said, you know why I do it? I do it to demean you all and to discredit you all so that when you write negative stories about me, no one will believe you. Um, and another quote is that... Surprisingly honest, isn't well, it? Well, he, yeah. he can be surprisingly honest about, <laughs> about things. And uh, Steve Bannon was talking to the author Michael Lewis, and he said, you know how you... And I apologize for the language here, but I'm going to use it anyway. Um, is that he, he, he was talking to Steve Bannon, and Steve Bannon described the press as the true opposition party. And uh, he said, you know the way to deal with the media, the me flood the zone with shit. Uh, and the idea is to just put out so much stuff so that people don't know what to believe. And when you don't know what to believe, you believe what is good for your tribe. So good for my tribe, true. Bad for my tribe, false. Uh, and it obliterates the very idea of objective truth. And that's a risky place to go, a very dangerous place to go. And we're, we're moving down that path fairly quickly these days. Well, I know that, you're, that you all, at your papers, um, uh, feel that you're, you're combating that with the aggressive and honest journalism you're doing, but I want to bore in on this and, and ask you, are there other ways, and, and certainly the panels like this is another way to do it, but are there other ways for the press to combat the idea that somehow it's corrupt? Well, well one, this is a good example of the kind of stuff we have to do. I suspect all three of us do more public appearances than all of our predecessors did. I think we have to talk about what we do. I think we have to go to the reader. I think we have to travel outside of our own circles and talk to people. Um, I think we have to get it right. I think we have to be honest when we don't get it right. Um, and then I think we have to relentlessly report and be accurate. I know that seems like the, the playbook from a different era, but I actually think that that playbook is even more valuable now because we're much more dependent on readers than we were on advertisers. Um, and I think that doing, expo I mean, all of our audiences are larger. I mean, more people read the New York Times today, many, by, by many, many degrees than ever before. So for all of the distrust, for all of the attacks, that also means that a larger number of people turn to our institutions for what they, for what they know is the truth. But you have changed. Uh, n these papers now uh, call out the president when he's lying and say <clears throat> he's lying. That's a change from a couple of years ago, I think. And, and so explain to me a little bit about other ways in which you've changed tactically, staying true to your values, but, but trying to adjust to a different reality. Well, I actually think that Dean hit on something that we're out speaking a lot and meeting people. I try to return most phone calls I get. Um, I try to answer most letters, can't do, do all, all of them. And I think these guys will agree even on a different level that uh, when you call someone back after they've told you um, how horrible you are and how, what a disgrace your newspaper is, 
and they, they say, oh my God, I can't believe you called me back. I didn't really mean all that. It's really, uh, you know, I, I think you misread it when you said that you were a total flaming. Uh, I think you didn't realize, I, didn't, I, I think you didn't realize I was saying how much I respected you. And uh, <laughs> so it's, a, it's, a, it's just a different kind of respect and a different kind of era. No, but seriously, when you reach out to readers, they really appreciate it, they, they're surprised. They really appreciate it, and I have actually gone to some people's homes uh, to show them that they were wrong about what we were saying about something. I was on my way home, I stopped and uh, actually explained it. Uh, you know, one of the things that's helpful uh, these days as a development, which is the development of podcasts and what news organizations are doing with podcasts, and, um, and that is you can, you can put the reporters uh, on the podcast. They can talk not just about the story, but the story behind the story and how the story came about. I think it really helps uh, when people can see people, uh, whether it's on, perhaps on television, and when they can hear them and they can talk at length about how they went about how they went about their journalism, and I think that that's a very helpful uh, development uh, because it, it sort of pulls back the curtain on the way that the journalism is practiced. So I want to shift gears a little bit now and go to the theory of the First Amendment. The theory of the First Amendment is that um, all the information will come out. Anybody, no matter how um, uh, wildly to the left or the right or, or any, any direction, um, can say whatever they want, can report what they want, can write what they want, and the truth will winnow out. Eventually, people will see the truth, and that that's how the First Amendment uh, works in moving us toward the truth. But does that work on social media? I think what we see on social media is people digging in, going to their own camp, and I worry that we, as print journalists, are facing a very new and different world in, in the internet and social media that maybe behaves differently when it comes to the First Amendment and the truth winnowing out. I'll tell you how deeply troubling this whole thing is, is that the other fundamental notion of the First Amendment is that this is a government uh, that's created by people who, do, who vote, and the, the uh, underlying notion is that the people who vote should know what the hell they're talking about. And in an era where there's so much disinformation, the Times had a story uh, over the weekend about um, a disinformation in the midterm elections. It was a very good story, Dean. Didn't get nearly enough attention. Um, the, uh, I was supposed to agree with that. I agree. Uh, I, was, I, <laughs> I didn't want to sound. <laughs> I did but, a thumbs up, as you said. So, yeah, so, so, so there's all this information, and you don't know what to believe, as Marty was saying. And so that's the fundamental notion, even more fundamental than yours, is that the people should know what the hell they're talking about is being undermined. Look, people have been worrying about this longer than I think we imagine. So uh, when Walter Lippmann wrote this book, Liberty in the News, he wrote it in 1920, so we're coming up on you know, 100 years, uh, 100 years <coughs> of the book. He was worried about uh, the impact of what what journalists were doing on our, on our democracy and the, the impact of so many different voices with its own spin, uh, influenced by, with, with a lot of different influences. <clears throat> and he was very concerned that this was going to have a deleterious effect on, on democracy and, um, and was urging sort of a more objective approach to the news. Now, the way that he defined objective, uh, and he was really the first person to sort of focus on that, uh, was a little bit different from what we talk about now is a sort of basically a very determined almost scientific way of trying to get at the actual facts uh, and one of the things he was very concerned about among many others was uh, propaganda he had actually been part of the propaganda machine during the Wilson administration and uh, he was concerned about the impact of government propaganda <coughs> on, on news organizations that they were susceptible to that and that they were susceptible to other things, their own, including their own ideas, their own opinions, things like that, and that we needed to get beyond that. And if we didn't get beyond that, that that would be a risk to, to democracy as well. Somehow democracy has survived uh, that, but um, these concerns are more deeply rooted. I think they, they are aggravated these days because there are so many places and so many voices now with the internet and with social media uh, that people will migrate to to <coughs> sources of so-called news or information uh, that, 
that affirms their pre-existing point of view, and then they won't be open to information that comes from other sources. And uh, that's, I think that's a very risky, that's a very risky path for us. It's, wor it's worth, it's worth, whenever, whenever I um, am deluged with um, all of the stuff that comes in on social media and all of the, the com competing journalism of all qualities, I, I always remind myself, this is better. And we shouldn't forget that. We shouldn't get so caught up in, in, um, in our criticism. I grew up in the South with two newspapers available to me and three local television stations. And, and the two newspapers at the time were not very good. And that same kid growing up in New Orleans can choose to read any number of newspapers online any place in the world. That same person has available to him, that same kid has available to him, a whole wide range of opinions. Yes, it's harder to, to separate the wheat from the chaff, but I, it, it's worth slowing down and saying that's still better than a period in society when you only had two or three voices and when the world seems so much smaller. I, I'm, I'm probably a, a, a little bit of an idealist, but I, but I think, as most editors are, I think over time this settles down, and it's but it's it's better. It's it's crazy making. It makes my life miserable sometimes, but it's better. But the burden has shifted <clears throat> in a really significant way. Uh, Marty, you referenced uh, Walter Lippmann and his his theory, which really put the burden on the press, on put the burden on the newspapers and the editors to make sure that things were objective, that, that, that things were neutral that things were balanced. It seems to me that with- Not that with, they were neutral, that they were factual. Yeah, thank you. The, um, the change, though, in, in this uh, high-tech uh, social media internet world <clears throat> really shifts the burden, I think, from uh, the newspapers or, or the media entities to the consumer. The consumer's gotta, gotta play a much bigger and more aggressive role in being judgmental about what they're getting. And are they playing it that way, or is it not working? Well, many of you remember the, uh, the uh, clothing chain called Sims, Cy Sims. And his advertising uh, um, line was, an educated consumer is our, best, is our best customer. And I would say the same thing about the Post-Gazette and about the Times and the Post. An educated consumer is our, is our best <coughs> customer. And yet we, under, we understand that a lot of people, you know, want to go, migrate to the things that they agree with. That's an American tradition too. How do you think the French, the um, American Revolution began? I mean, well, the committees of correspondence were not objective uh, newspapers. They were the uh, stuff they put out was uh, had a certain ideological tinge to it. Uh, it wasn't particularly congenial to the King of England. Um, that's an American tradition. Only in, really, in our lifetimes, or, or a little bit, a little bit bef before that, has American journalism been as straight as it is today. You know, I, I've been asked a, a lot by people, well, how do I know, how do I know who to trust? And, you know, one, it's, it's a tough question to answer, uh, but I think you have to go through a series of steps. Uh, I mean, one of them is, um, uh, is this a news organization that allows a variety of opinions, for example, on its op-ed pages, if it's, an, if it's a newspaper, uh, or does it only have one that it offers? Uh, so, for example, on our op-ed page, we have a wide range of, uh, a wide range of opinions, uh, on, <coughs> and we encourage that, and we're constantly looking for new voices to be there. Uh, is this an organization that actually has reporters? Do they have a substantial staff? Uh, we have about, at the Post, we have about 850 journalists in our organization. I can tell you that if we were engaged in just fabricating stories, fake news, uh, I don't need 850 people to do that. I can assure you, I can save a, we can save a lot of money, um, and a couple of people would be fine. Uh, so, um, I mean, this is just not—it's not what we do. And we have people who are, you know, do you if you're if you're writing about what's happening around the world, do you actually have correspondents around the world on the scene? Do you have people who are who are eyewitnesses? 
Those are the kinds of things that, you know, the exercise that people need to go through. I mean, why is it that in our society that somebody like, you know, Alex Jones at InfoWars uh, is believed by so many people when he says that the, the killings at, uh, in Newtown at Sandy Hook Elementary School, that those were fake, that, those were, that they were synthetic, that they were using child actors, that this was choreographed by the Obama administration in order to support gun control. I mean, it's just appalling, and you can imagine what those parents feel like, and many of them have talked about what it feels like to be described as participants in a hoax. And yet, he had a, he has a, he has a, hu he had a huge Twitter following and Facebook following, and, and his YouTube videos were watched by millions of people, uh, and people bought into it. And some of those people started harassing the parents of kids who were murdered in Newtown. And that's horrifying. And, it's, and uh, people need to be educated as well. Did he have any reporters there? Uh, you know, what kind of news organization does he have? Is it even a news organization, which it's not? And that's the sort of critical thinking that I think consumers of news need to go through. But if the question then is one of education, of the public being better educated about how to be citizens, how to ask their own questions, what's the role for, for newspapers in trying to advance that education? I would, I would go back to what we said before. I mean, we have not been good historically in letting people, in, a, in an era when, to be frank, 80% of our revenue came from advertising. And we probably didn't quite treat the reader with the respect that our generation of editors treats them now. I don't think we understood how to let people know why they should trust us. I think that we were a little arrogant. I think we said, of course you understand that that dateline means that that person is not only in Kabul, but she's risking her life. Of course you know that we have all these reporters and everything is true and factual. I think that the, I think that the reader, of course, has to have a large burden to, to separate responsible media from irresponsible media, but I think we could make it a lot easier for them. I think we can make, make our case a lot more forcefully at what we do, how much of our reporting. I mean, I think that, that all of our news organizations in, in describing the backgrounds of our reporters and in just being much more open to how we do business, I think that that's a big, I, I, don't, I don't think you can overstate how big that is. I mean, I grew up in an era when if a reader called up when I was a 21, a 20 year old reporter in New Orleans, if a reader called up, you hung up on him. It's like, why are you bothering me? I'm doing my work for me and my friends here. And I think that's that is a giant change I in the never way we operate. <laughs> yeah, you just didn't pick it up. That's all. <laughs> you know, I, I go back to one of uh, Dean's predecessors twice, or four times removed. When I joined the New York Times in 19, um, uh, well, I guess it was 1850. You know, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Abe Rosenthal said. Marty and I used to read you when we were kids. Yeah. We were <laughs> <laughs> used to cut it out and put it in your refrigerator, right? Um, uh, Abe Rosenthal, who was the executive editor of the New York Times, uh, said, told me this. When one educated person somewhere in America runs into another educated person somewhere in America at 9 a.m., each will assume of the other that they've read the New York Times. That sentence would never come out of the, his, his mouth. Right. Never, because it's a much different world. Right. Right. Uh, last May on Meet the Press, the historian John Meacham said, uh, talking about history and how history has worked to protect us, there are three or four forces that have saved the republic at various points. The presidency, the Congress, the press, the courts, the people. And it seems to me today that we're pretty reliant on the press and the courts. How does it seem to you? Well, first of all, I want to make a concession. And Marty, you don't know this, but when I was working for you as Washington Bureau Chief of the Globe and you were editor, uh, editor of the Globe, John Meacham applied for a job at the Washington Bureau, and I turned him down. <laughs> wow. When I, see him, <laughs> when, I, when, when I see him at a book party, I'm going to coming up, I'm yeah. actually going to let him know who was responsible yeah. for that. Thank you very much. Lest he hold it against me. Yeah. <laughs> the courts. Look, everybody has responsibility in a democracy. I think it's. I think one of the, we were talking earlier about the decline in confidence in American institutions, not just the press, but certainly the press, but other institutions as well. And I think that that's what we have to worry about. 
Uh, I think it's really hard to have a democracy when you don't have strong institutions. I think it's really hard to have a democracy when you don't have people agree on a baseline set of facts. I mean, we should argue about policies. People should argue. They should argue vigorously about those sorts of things. And that's why we have a democracy. And I think that's one of the great things about a democracy is the competition for ideas. Uh, but ultimately, you have to agree on a baseline set of facts, like what happened yesterday. Uh, and it's concerning when, that, when we don't have that. Uh, I think that much of the press is, is trying to do its job the way that it should be done, uh, taking a lot of flack for it, but that's okay, uh, because I think we have a strong, we have a strong sense of mission. Uh, the courts, as far as I can tell, seem to be doing their jobs the way that they're supposed to be done. Uh, you know, uh, I think we, you know, we need other institutions to do their job, to do their jobs as well. And uh, it's, it's a hard thing to maintain a democracy. It's not, the, it's not the norm. Uh, in, in the world. Uh, and so I think all of us have a, a, a role to play and we should play it and we shouldn't be going about the business of trying to destroy those institutions which are fundamental to a strong democracy. Well, I would, I would go even further and just say that uh, America, you won't express, expect to hear this from a panel of editors, but America is stronger when it has a strong Republican Party. Uh, the Republican Party has been a major part of our, uh, of our country since 1856. Um, it's, it's a different, difficult situation right now. Uh, and we need all of our institutions to be strong. The press, the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, the judiciary, and the legislature, which um, was once described as America's only, only native criminal class. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, we need them all to be strong, and it makes us stronger, and it makes our our role even more enhanced. It it, David didn't want John Meacham in the, the Washington Bureau of the Boston Globe because he wanted only one historian <laughs> in the uh, Washington Bureau of the Boston Globe. I, I do think this is a, this is a I mean, it's a, to say the obvious, a large moment in the history of the press where, where our role in raising questions about powerful institutions is even more important than ever. Because I would leave, I would not, I would, I would include, by the way, that we also play a large role in questioning some of the powerful private institutions, whether it's the platforms, whether it's the major corporations that, that sway the government, whether it's even other governments like the Saudi government. I think this is, a, this is a, a, an important moment for the press. I think it's an important moment for the press to be as ambitious as possible, um, to not see borders in our, in our need to call power, power into question. And, um, and I think that it's unfortunate that there are fewer institutions that can do that for economic reasons um, than there were 20 years ago. But I think it's an important, I mean, you know, the, Uni the United States is, is at war in various parts of the world in ways we don't understand and don't know, which predates the Trump administration. Um, there are, there are, you know, the, the story is much larger too than Donald Trump. And I think that there's, there, it's, a, it's a moment where the press is called upon to be more ambitious than it's ever been. You know, uh, some people sometimes ask me when they're thinking about a career, why do you want to be a journalist? And I say, well, it's great because you get to ask impertinent, impertinent questions of your social betters. And if those social betters <laughs> aren't strong, it's much, much less fun. Uh, Representative Adam Schiff, who we see on television very, fairly frequently, uh, has said repeatedly that he sees greater threats to America and democracy f internally than he does from any meddling by Russia. And that sort of surprised me, even coming from Adam Schiff. Uh, I wonder how you see that and how you, since, you're, since you have put so much, uh, so many of your resources into covering uh, the question of how much meddling Russia has done, uh, how would you see that balance? Well, look, I mean, these are not mutually exclusive. First of all, I wouldn't call it meddling. I would call it interference. Uh, meddling uh, diminishes what, yes. what actually transpired, and it was, uh, I think, highly consequential interference in the election. Um, you know, the matter of whether there was some sort of collaboration or collusion uh, with the Trump campaign is a separate matter, but it's well documented that there was interference in the, Amer in the American election. Uh, that's a matter of concern. And uh, then we have our own domestic concerns as, as well. And you know, I, I get concerned about, it's not, it's not just a matter of whether, 
we're observing the letter of the law. It's a matter of whether we're observing the democratic norms uh, that have sustained this country over uh, such a long period of time. Uh, actually, not so long, really, when you think about it in comparison to other countries. Uh, and it's how we behave with each other, whether, we've, whether there are modes of civility, whether we can have disagreements uh, without uh, seeing each other as the enemy, uh, without describing each other as the opposition party, whether we recognize that there's a role for the press as written into the, as written into the, you know, the First Amendment, uh, that, th that there's respect for the role as, you know, James Madison talked about examining public characters and measures is what he talked about. That's what we are supposed to do in addition to public characters and measures think powerful institutions and powerful individuals who have an impact on the lives of ordinary people, we're also supposed to, to look at that. And that that should be expected of us uh, and that people should respect that role, I think, within this society. Uh, and, and the same is true for respect for the other uh, fundamental institutions in our, in our society. And when that begins to erode, I think we, uh, that's when we really need to worry. And I think those are the kinds of internal domestic concerns that probably Congressman Schiff was talking about. But Max, except with the exception of the period 1941 to 45, the threat to this country has always been more internal than external. The McCarthy, McCarthyism, uh, some of the notions of Charles Lindbergh, you know, Marty talked about some of the stuff during World War I, surely the uh, Civil War and the uh, Alien and Sedition Acts. The threat, the threat to our democracy almost always is more homegrown than external. I think if, if which I don't I don't know how to balance the Russia versus the the internal I don't I don't think we, we know enough but if Schiff meant um, the relentless attack by this administration on the institutions including the press that are necessary to uphold the democracy he's right um, I mean it, it we we do have a president who not only regularly attacks the press regularly calls out you know, individual journalists regularly calls out independent institutions, judges, um, even members of his own cabinet. I mean, it, it, is, I, I, it is remarkable that the President of the United States beats up the intelligence community, the Attorney General, pretty regularly. If, if Schiff meant that undermining those independent pillars of the democracy is the most troublesome threat, he's got a point. David, you wrote recently that the upcoming election, uh, very, very soon now, is a midterm examination for our political system. What did you mean by that? How consequential do you think this is in terms of our political system and its functioning? Well, it's, a con it's consequential because if there's a change in the, um, in the makeup of the House of Representatives, the president will be uh, vulnerable to far more scrutiny to, uh, he'll be vulnerable to the subpoena power of many, many committees. He's vulnerable, and so is just Justice Kavanaugh, to the possibility of being impeached, though I think it's unlikely, and neither faces any threat from the Senate. But it's very vital. It's, it's along with a handful of other, I'd say 1918 and 1970 and a few others, 38, the most consequential uh, midterms in our history. And what's gonna happen, do you think? Uh, for two dollars on the eighth of November, we'll tell you all about it. <laughs> Marty and Dean, how how crucial do you see this election? I'll be sure to read the yeah. post that. <laughs> Why? If you can do it one day earlier, I'll give you three dollars. <laughs> I'm I'm sorry, Max. What was it? what was the question? How crucial do you see this election being? Oh, I don't know. I'm not a political pundit, and I'm not going to start right now, so uh, I'm not going to. I'm not going to really get into that. If, if, I won't predict it, but it's huge. I mean, if the, if the Democrats end up having more power in Washington, without question, you're going to have a relentless series of investigations, whether impeachment or not, who knows? I mean, everything from you know, the story we, we did a few, month, a few weeks ago about the president's history of not paying taxes and how his family got wealthy or Russia, as if, if, if the Democrats gain more power in Congress, it, there, there's no question there's going to be a relentless series of investigations and a story that's already powerful and consuming and is going to, is going to get more powerful and consuming. And if that does not happen, it's, it's inevitable that the President of the United States will see that as a large national pat on his back. 
Um, and he will, ha and that the Republican Party itself will see it as a large symbol to them that he is now the all-powerful leader of their, of their party. So whichever the outcome, it's going to be huge. It's a big deal. I agree. One of the things that the four of us were talking about uh, a little bit earlier before we came on stage was how little history the average American knows and how important history can be. And I think we make that same mistake sometimes with the First Amendment. And we think, oh my God, because um, President Trump or others may say threatening things, the First Amendment is challenged in ways that are unbelievable and unprecedented. And that's certainly not true. I mean, if you think back to World War I, Woodrow <laughs> Wilson shut down the First Amendment in a very autocratic way. I wonder if the three of you could talk a little bit about, I know you're all students of history, about how the First Amendment has fared at various times through history. Well, they always say that the first uh, casualty in war is, is truth. And so we've seen that throughout our, our lifetimes in Vietnam, surely, and uh, and even first casualty of truth came before the Iraq War of 2003. Um, and so I think it's, uh, it's always a danger. President Lincoln was no great friend of the First Amendment while the Civil War was going on. So it's always a, always a challenge. But you know, in an institution like this, the First Amendment has many, many dimensions. And uh, I wouldn't sh give short shrift to the uh, freedom of religion that's, uh, that even precedes the freedom of the press in the First Amendment. Well, you know, as, as, Dave, I mean, as David's pointed out, I mean, this First Amendment has been under challenge uh, for since, uh, you know, the time of John Adams, actually. He right. was the first one with the Sedition Act. And, and then Woodrow Wilson. And, uh, you know, we had the McCarthy era. We had lots of other, you know, in, instances to, over the course of American history where the First Amendment has come under challenge. Uh, I can't say that uh, there are a lot of attacks on the press now. I think there's an effort to sort of marginalize us and, uh, uh, and to basically undercut us and undermine our role in, in American society. I think it's highly corrosive over the, over the long run. Uh, but, you know, the president himself has been a beneficiary of the First Amendment. I mean, he just won a libel suit, um, you know, brought by Stormy Daniels uh, on basically taking advantage of what the First Amendment allows him to do. And uh, he's talked about <clears throat> sort of rewriting the libel laws, which are basically at the state level anyway, but I'm not sure he can do very much. Certainly the Supreme Court can change its interpretation. That's possible. But, um, but he's been a beneficiary of the First Amendment, what, perhaps one of the greatest beneficiaries. If we had the right, if Americans had the right to actually successfully sue the president for the kinds of statements he's made, you know, he'd be, he wouldn't be as rich as he is today. Uh, whatever, however rich he is, <laughs> uh, he wouldn't be as rich as he, he isn't as rich as he is today. Um, you know, I, my view is that, uh, I, there's a quote that I like, which I also brought, uh, which is um, this quote from Justice Robert H. Jackson in a 1945 ruling on behalf of the First Amendment. And uh, he said, every person must be his own watchman for the truth, for truth, because the forefathers did not trust any government to separate the true from the false for us. And I really believe that. And uh, we don't want to end up in a situation where people say the only person telling the truth is the, head, is the chief of state, the head of state. And uh, we have to be our own watchmen for, for, for truth. We have to get information from reliable, reliable sources. You can't be a, go about the business of trying to discredit and undermine institutions, whether it's the press, the courts, the intelligence agency, law enforcement, all of that, and say, I am the only source of truth. Uh, if we go down that, that road, then we're heading to a, a, a system that I think none of us will, will recognize. I think this, this president may be extreme, of course, not maybe, he is extreme, but I don't think I've covered a president as a reporter, Washington bureau chief or editor of a newspaper who truly, truly practiced full disclosure. Um, I, don't, I don't think any president that I've ever been involved in covering felt completely comfortable with the First Amendment. I think they did, they may have sort of morally felt comfortable with it, but confront, when confronted with hard questions about the way they conduct war, when confronted with hard questions about the way they make internal decisions that when they made mistakes, I don't think there's been a president who's been completely comfortable with it, which is why us 
our institutions being, being independent and credible are so important? Well, you know, the courts expand and contract law in a variety of ways through history. And in the last 60 years, the courts have really expanded the reach, the breadth of the First Amendment in really wonderful and significant ways. But is there a fear that maybe the courts in the next 20 or 30 years will contract a lot of those freedoms? Go ahead. Sure. Uh, David. <laughs> oh, thanks. Well, yeah, you're, of course. David, you're the historian. <laughs> it's always yeah. that fear. It's always that fear. But take a look at the three of us. Do we look particularly lovable? Um, well, yes. Marty, you maybe. But the, <laughs> I mean, we're pretty stubborn here. And we, we know how to fight and we know how to do our jobs. And I, I think the First Amendment is in uh, good hands when these two gentlemen are editors of the two most important papers in the country and there are other editors across the country who are fighting to do their work and who believe in, we are the, actually, I want to say this, we are the last believers. We believe in the United States. We believe in the Constitution. We believe in the Bill of Rights more than anyone almost on, on earth. We, we, we are so naive that we actually believe in it all. <laughs> stretch, if you if you stretch the the definition of attacks on on press freedom to be me, even a little bit beyond the First Amendment, I worry about the proliferation of leak investigations. I worry about that this administration and this Justice Department has made it very clear that um, that they that they don't like leaks, that they don't like disclosures of information they don't think should be disclosed. It just so happens that we're at a time of technology and warfare and the rise of intelligence and the rise of the military, that there's a lot of stuff that's going on in the world involving the United States that people don't know about and don't understand. And I think those are, te and, and we, we are completely reliant on anonymous sources and classified information to understand what the US role is in Pakistan, what the US role is in Syria, what the US role is in, in Niger and all over the world. So the attack on the, the, the constant investigations of leaks scares the hell out of me. And, and I think that's going to continue, especially if, if you outline a, a plan where the Republicans maintain control of Congress. And I think that's really scary at a moment when so much of what we know about what government does is going to come from anonymous sources and is classified. We're just about out of time, so I wanted to give each of you 20 or 25 seconds each for a final thought, something maybe that we haven't even covered that you think is important. David? I think that we have a panelist on this panel who actually knows how to pronounce Niger. Uh, Niger. Niger. <laughs> Tells us that the New York Times is in good hands, and so is the press. <laughs> uh, gee, I don't know that I have a grand final thought, except that, you know, I mean, I do think that um, just to reiterate, I think there's a determined effort now to try to obliterate the idea of objective fact. Uh, and I think that as a democracy, we need to agree on a baseline set of facts. And uh, there are organizations that we're, look, we have, we're flawed for sure uh, because we're human. We're like people in any other profession. We make mistakes. Uh, but I think there's no question that we are determined in our mission to try to get at the facts and try to get at the truth. And uh, that's a, you know, w it, on, when I walk into our newsroom every day, uh, I look at the principles that were set down in 1935, <clears throat> and the first one is to tell the truth as nearly as the truth may be ascertained. Uh, and that's what we try to do. It recognizes that uh, that's a process. That's a process of striving. The truth can be elusive, but it also recognizes that there is such a thing as truth and there are such things as facts. And it's not just a matter of your personal opinion or how much power you have or how big a megaphone you have. The only thing I want to say in closing is to repeat something I said before. Um, it's, it's really easy to get into a panic, and I do it myself sometimes, over the way information sort of has sort of flooded in the zone. Um, but it is important to remember this is better. It is important to remember that we have so much more access to information than we've ever had before. Yes, there's crap, but somebody who lives in New Orleans can now read the Washington Post in real time. That's a big deal. When I was a kid, I could get the New York Times at the library a week and a half later, and I couldn't get the Washington Post. You can get the Post Post Gazette in New Orleans, by the way. That's okay. yeah. Well, that's in real time, too. 
But I think that's a, that's a, we just can't, we can't get in such a panic, and I get the panic, I'm panicked too. We can't get in such a panic that we forget that. That's huge and significant. Thank, thank you, Dean, and please, all of you, join me in thanking this extraordinary <clears throat> thank <you>. group of leaders. <clears throat>